Hey there, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, however you are attending Grace Church. We are so glad that you're here. My name is Aaron, and if you thought you were gonna get number eight of the fundamental list, uh, you're gonna be a little disappointed because today we are gonna take a little, a little side journey and to, to, to see, uh, to make really personal and really applicable number seven uh, in the fundamental list. And it's gonna have a little bit of a story and it's gonna have a little bit of history, uh, but I think it's worthwhile to know kind of how Grace Church is doing the thing that we said is a fundamental. And last week, the scripture was this. It was Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20, verse 18, verse 19, and verse 20, when Jesus gives the great commission. And he says uh, this, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. And we talked about that, that it was a command to go and it was a command to make disciples. And then it was the, 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 the how was given as well. Here's how you make disciples. You, you baptize them, which means that you, you tell them what they need to believe and then they accept it. They accept it as true and they put their trust in Jesus and then they make that internal reality uh, an external symbol in baptism. That's, that's, that's what it means to be, you know, baptizing them. And then it says that you teach them. Not teach them to know about Jesus, not teach them Greek or Hebrew, though those things are fine, not teach them systematic theology. No, no, no. Teach them to obey, to observe all that Jesus commanded. And that led us to point seven in the fundamental list, is that Jesus' followers, all Jesus' followers are multipliers. All Jesus' followers are multipliers. That if you wanna be a follower of Jesus, if you, if you say, I am a follower of Jesus, then you need to be about his agenda, his work. You need to be about multiplication. Now, it looks different for everybody. And if you say, well, I'm not gonna be a street preacher, like I get it, that's okay. That's, I mean, everyone has a responsibility to multiply how God has gifted them, how God has called them, how <laughs> the, the opportunities God has given them to their capacity and, their, and, their, and, and just a lot of things. And in the same way though, it, it goes to show that a church as a church, we need to be about this as well, right? That's a logical conclusion, that if all the, all the members of a church, all the, all the body parts of the body of Christ are on mission making disciples by baptizing and teaching, if, if they're doing, if everyone is on that mission, then it makes sense that the church is also on mission. And because we believe that Jesus' followers are multipliers, and we also believe deeply that the fundamental list number six is absolutely true, that the church is God's agent of transformation, uh, personally, culturally, and globally. We believe that. We hold to that. We, we hold it deep down in our bones that that is true, then it stands to, to be that the church should be about Transformation and multiplication. Transformation and multiplication. Transformation and multiplication. Now, way back, actually way, way back, in 1939, Grace Church launched in Albuquerque here. All the way back in 1939, no, I was not the founding pastor. I had somebody ask me that. I was not. I was just a young man back in 39. Um, but I was, you know, I, I, I came here in 20, in, uh, in 20, in 2008. Um, uh, so I wasn't even close to that. But in 1939, the Grace Church launched because it, they wanted to, uh, to launch a Bible believing church here in this city, a Bible teaching, Bible believing, uh, mission focused gospel teaching church. And that's been, it's been the history for 
85 years? It's getting, it's getting up there. And I took over as senior pastor in 2018. It was six years ago. Sometimes it seems like that was six months ago. Sometimes it seems like that was 60 years ago. Uh, it just depends what day it is. But in, 20, in 2018, I believe we walked into 2018 in new leadership with a God-given vision. And that vision, now, now what, well, first, what is a vision? A vision is a desired future. It's the future that I think Jesus was calling us to and still is because Jesus' followers multiply and faithful churches do what all followers should do. Faithful churches should multiply. Uh, We believe that. And so we had this vision that had to do with multiplication. And so we said that we felt God calling us, uh, me and the leadership felt God calling us to do this. To develop, and, and so I, there was this frame, and you can take a look at it. You know, it's, it's, it's only, the only one that's still really, really important is the top one. And the top says this, the top one says this, that we believe that God has called us in the next, you know, we said five years to develop and launch teams, to plant and revitalize churches across Albuquerque, New Mexico, the United States, and around the world, globally. And so we said, well, it's, okay, if we're going to do that, we, we, we feel very strongly that God has called us to develop and launch teams to, to plant and revitalize churches because we understand that Jesus' followers are multipliers, but faithful churches are also multipliers. And so we said, okay, in, in three years, we've got to increase services. We've got to have people mentoring one-on-one and one-on-ten. We've got to have more grace groups. We've got to have more international opportunities to go and, and serve the church globally. We said that, that was really important. And let me tell you, um, uh, besides the first one, uh, those have happened. The second one didn't happen because we were on the trajectory uh, but this little thing called COVID got involved. You might remember it. And we said that was what we needed to do to make sure that we were working towards that, that preferred future, that, that God-given vision of the future. And we said, what is it going to take to do that? Man, we need 40 people to, be, to, be, to raise up, to do some of these things, to help in these certain areas. Uh, they need to be teachable. They need to be passionate. They, we needed 40 people to step up that said, I have a heart for developing and launching teams and seeing the church grow. Seeing the church, seeing the church multiply, not just believers, but churches multiply as well. We said, okay, to do that, we had, we, you know, we needed uh, people here at the church. We said in the next 90 days, we need people to have, you know, gospel conversations. Uh, we needed to raise up 10 new leaders because we had had a, 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 we, a lot of people were saying like, yeah, I'm, I don't know if I want to lead. I don't know if I want to be a part of this thing that's going on here at Grace Church since they've, you know, had this big leadership change. We said, hey, we need two additional groups called them grace groups, grace groups back then. And we said we needed a prayer team to move us along, move us forward. Now, let me tell you. Let me tell you, that's, uh, you know, 90 days, a year, three years, five years. Those were big goals. And let me tell you, I, I had no idea. I had no idea what, how God was gonna do this thing he had called us to. And if I'm honest, can I be honest with you? If I'm honest, I wasn't sure he was gonna do it. But when you know what I was gonna do? I was gonna give it my all. And not just me, or I mean, that's, it's silly. Like, in fact, uh, I think now, six years later, uh, (laughs) my importance in this, in this, uh, in this venture has become less because we've seen people step up. In the last six years, we've seen way more than 40 people step up to this task. But let me tell you, in ways that I would have never thought, in ways that I couldn't have predicted or imagined, we have had, we have way more people mentoring, we have more groups, we have gone on way more trips, uh, and, and, and not just globally, but locally as well. We have lots of people praying, uh, though our prayer team is getting reestablished, Reestablished. Uh, we have way more than ten leaders. We, we added way more than ten, and gospel conversations was has become part of our culture now. 
And so I wasn't sure God could do this. Now that's, and that sounds silly. But I, I clung to that promise in Matthew 28. You know, go and make disciples, right? All authority's been given to me. All authority has been given to me, Jesus said. So go and make disciples. Teach them, baptize them. And remember, I am with you. I am with you. I am with you. I am with you whenever it doesn't look like we're gonna have any new leaders. It looks like, because I remember I, it was June of 2018 when I, when I un, unrolled this, unveiled this. I remember a month later, we didn't have 10 new leaders. We needed 11 new leaders because one quit. And so I, I, didn't, I didn't know. I was like, God, it's already bad. It's already going bad. We're starting off bad. But I clung to this promise that Jesus is with me when I am on mission with him. And again, not just me. Because people were excited. And people started thinking, well, I, I, wanna, I wanna do this and I wanna, I wanna be a part of this. We had, uh, we had people come together and said, you know, we wanna be trained up in how to do church planting and revitalization. Oh. So we had a core, of, of, uh, a core group of residents. And we had more people in groups. And we were rolling, man, in 2019. I, I, it's, so much had been done in a year, I was shocked. And then again, this little thing we call COVID, you might remember it, came around and it kind of took the wind out of our sails. And again, I thought, God, I don't know if you can, like, I don't know if we can do this. And I don't know, I, are you gonna, you called us to this, are you gonna help us with this? You called me to help lead this. You called us as a church to do this. I know you want this because followers, Jesus followers multiply and faithful churches also multiply. But how is any of this going on? How is any of this happen, happening? And I remember those, those groups, those, uh, that set of church planter residents Everybody had some time on their hands in 2020. And so we, we did this, this residency group of training up leaders. Uh, to, and, and let me tell you, a lot of them said, you know what, I'm gonna get trained up to a certain extent, a certain amount, and then I'm done because I'm not called to be a church planter. And that's great. Because now we have all these new leaders, they are trained up, They've, they have been in the, some of the highest positions here, leading the, some of the most important ministries here at Grace Church. And in 2020, God gave us this opportunity to start revitalizing a church down in the South Valley. Because before, we had, been, we had been helping out. We had been consulting, we, but we weren't invested we were, in, we were invested, but as much as you could be with an independent church that didn't want you to have any authority and any, you know, it was, it, was, it, was, it was a mutual relationship. But in 2020, that all changed whenever we took on this, this church revitalization. We sent folks, we sent folks from Grace Church down to the South Valley. We... Uh, several of us here, several of us here uh, at Grace Church became board members down there because they did not have a uh, a group of mature believers to become their board, uh, and we helped guide that. In fact, one of our very own, uh, him and his wife and his son, uh, they moved down there, and John Gwynn became the pastor. And before I could complain to God more, he showed me that he was faithful that he was with us, that he wanted this to happen as well. And so we raised up leaders. We raised up leaders, and what we thought we were raising up leaders to go plant churches, uh, we raised up leaders to help 
some of the most important functions here at Grace Church. And not only that, but then some of those, uh, some of those church residents moved. They moved away. They, they, a couple of them moved churches whenever circumstances changed. And again, we helped the kingdom. We helped the kingdom by providing leadership and providing trained leadership to those churches where they could go in and immediately plug in and help and make a difference. And so we saw that. We saw those 40 people that, and it was more than 40. We saw those 40. We also saw people, uh, during this time, we started a relationship with a church in El Salvador. You heard about it a couple of weeks ago. A church in El Salvador that we started this relationship with, and we we didn't know what we, we didn't know what to do. We were coming out of COVID, and I thought, man, God, this would be so great. We could have, God, what are you doing? Because I didn't even know. And so I think now we've had four or five teams. I think another team is going in the fall. We have helped this church revitalize. It, the pandemic had almost wiped this church out, and we had we had gone down there, and other people had stepped up. Again, it was way more than the 40. And people started praying. In fact, in 2021, we gave the vision talk again because we said, you know what? Man, we were coming out of this pandemic. We, I think there needs to be a few changes to, the, to how we, we do this because we're getting, you know, we're coming up on this, uh, this three-year mark. And so we said, you know, we need 300 people praying. And so we had, it wasn't quite 300. We had a lot of people praying. And I think, I honestly think more people are, were praying than signed up. And so we had people praying for, for people to develop and launch teams to help revitalize and plant churches in Albuquerque and in New Mexico and the United States and around the world. And so we saw this. And again, we said, okay, God, you're on the move. And so we, we, went, to, we went to El Salvador this little church was almost wiped out and they, they said, we just need a little help. And that's really all, I mean, they needed just a little help. We, we did mission trips. We, we helped them remodel some of their church, to make it a little, more, a little more accessible, a little more friendly, a little more, uh, you know, beauty, beautify it a little bit, make it, a, you know, make it a, a, a diamond in the neighborhood and not, you know, the worst house on the block. We... We, helped, we got them plugged in with other uh, organizations. We got them plugged in with Johnny and Friends down in Central America. We showed them what it was like to, to be good news in their neighborhood for people affected by disabilities. They've done respites. They've done uh, VBS, uh, you know, vacation Bible schools, you know, after school clubs for families affected by disability. And they, they have done this amazing work and they've grown. And so in 2024, three years later from 2021, I think it's time we amend the vision a little bit. Again, not, not the top part, because the top part is absolutely still the goal. Because if, G, the, if Jesus' followers are multipliers, then that just, the logical step is that Jesus' following churches are also about multiplication. And so, but, we, but the details change. And we see God working and we see God opening opportunities and new paths. And let me just tell you, uh, you know, when we started this back in 2018, our, our thinking was, because the trajectory we're on is like, hey, we're gonna grow and we're gonna, get, we're gonna get bigger. But let me just tell you, in the last, in six years, we have seen that getting bigger is not simply the goal because it is to get better. It is to get better. Now getting, you know, I, I think uh, I, I heard it a long time from somebody I can't even remember, but he said this, healthy things grow. So we aren't anti-growth here at Grace. We're not, we're not you, know, all, you know, us four and no more. We're not trying to stay the same size. But listen, healthy th- while healthy things grow, bigger doesn't mean better. Better means better. And when we are better equipped, and when we are better trained, and when we are better focused, and when, when we have a clearer, better picture of, of, of how God is leading us to accomplish this goal, then we grow. 
But let me tell you, there's another thing that grows that's not healthy, a tumor. <laughs> tumors grow. Some tumor, tumors grow really quick. They're not healthy. I tend to, I think healthy churches, I think healthy churches, by and large, there's always exceptions. I've, I was actually a part of a church that grew really quickly. It was not really healthy. It took years and years of, of work after it grew to get healthy. I think a church like ours, a mature church, a church that's been around for 85 years, for it to grow, it grows. It grows like you grow at the gym. It's slow. At first, you don't notice anything. You're just kind of sore. <laughs> You're putting in all this hard work and nothing really seems to be happening. But eventually, you walk by the mirror and you go, oh, man. So my, do I have a little muscle? Man, how cool is that? And we've seen that in the last since 2021, since we've reopened after COVID, we have seen this incremental growth. But we also, we don't just wanna be bigger, we want to be multipliers. We wanna be multipliers. And so that top has, the, 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 the top of that frame hasn't changed. God is still calling us to a future where we develop and launch teams to plant and revitalize churches in Albuquerque, across Albuquerque, in New Mexico, in the United States, and around the world. And God has been faithful to do that. So what that means is we, so we have some initiatives. And so we, right now, we have four main initiatives that, are, that we are going through that we see, we see God moving and we see God moving hugely in three of them. And one is we think God is calling, but in three years, it may not be on this next list. The first one is Northwest Rio Rancho. We uh, have a resident here, Braden. You have met him, uh, he, or a, <clears throat> a person that was part of that first group of residents that has said, I want to be, I want to be, I want to be about church planning. <clears throat> and he wants to plant a church in Northwest Rio Rancho. You're going to see more of him this summer. And we are actively training him up to plant where he lives in Northwest Rio Rancho. El Salvador. Man, El Salvador, again, I told you we've taken, I think it's four or five trips and we're gonna do another trip in the fall of this year. If you wanna go, you gotta let us know. Uh, we could, we're, you know, if you wanna be part of what we're doing, don't just need 40. We don't just need 300 people praying. We need everybody. We need people to, that wanna go, people that wanna pray, people that wanna pay for that, people that wanna to give to that stuff. And so, El Salvador's done something really cool because they were so inspired by our, <clears throat> by our effort of revitalization that they recently took a mission trip in El Salvador. Now, this is a church with not many resources. I mean, you and I, you and I would call them a very poor church. Uh, in El Salvador, they're just like a you know, middle-class church. They don't have that many resources. They don't, you know, flying across, you know, flying internationally is not really an option uh, for most of them. But they took a mission trip that many of the church could go on. And they went to two churches that they say, man, these churches, they really have no resources. They are poor, poor. And they need revitalization. They have a pastor that's passionate. They have uh, people that, that care about the gospel. They want to reach their community. And so that, that church in El Salvador went on that mission trip and helped revitalize those other two churches. How cool is that? And so we are still working in El Salvador. In fact, I think when we go in the fall, we are gonna go to those other two churches too and help them as well. The third one is Mesa Valley. Now, Mesa Valley used to be called Sunrise. I mean, it's, it's been a lot of things. Uh, it's, been a, it's, been a, it's had a number of different names, but uh, John Gwynn and his wife Jessica and their son Ian is down there. He's been the pastor since 2020, so four years. And let me tell you, that church gone, went from 10 or 11. It's now running 40. He has since added a member of his church to the board. He has... Uh, done so much with the grounds. They have, a, uh, they have another, they're helping another church. There's a Spanish speaking church that meets in their facility in the afternoons. They have church on Sunday afternoon. And so that church is helping another church 
to plant. It's not a revitalization, it's a plant. And so we go down there. In fact, there's several from Grace Church. Uh, one, of our, one of our members here at Grace is, is the chairman of the board down there, and he helps with finances, and he helps with, with strategy and direction. Uh, John, I mentor John in, in pastoral things, and just... We, Helping that church become, helping that church replant and revitalize has been a joy. It's not done, but it is, it, it will be one day. And then the fourth one is the East Mountains uh, in Southeast Albuquerque. Now, God just keeps kind of pulling us that way. There are some circumstances, there are some people, there are, there's just, I don't even know what it's about. This is one of those things where it's like, God, show me what to do. But I'm just letting you know, this is, and so we need your prayers. Because I said, you know, again, maybe in three years, this uh, Southeast Albuquerque, East Mountains, doesn't even, make the, doesn't even make the list, but maybe it does. Now, this is where it starts to get a little different because we also saw that we needed to, we needed to have some credibility here at the church. <laughs> because if we are trying to develop and launch teams to plant revitalized churches, we need to be, because we, what we do when we go, when, when you do that, you have to ask those, those, those churches in those communities, what are you doing to reach your community? What are you doing? How are you reaching your community? What are you doing to actively recruit people in, to invite them in? To, to, how are you making disciples in your community? And that's a great question to ask them because that's what, that's what those churches need to be doing that are planting and revitalizing. But what, what I saw is we had not a great answer when they said, well, hey, what are you doing? And I was like, well, we've just been a church for a long time. That's what we're doing. So we need to get better. We needed to get better. We needed to, we needed to get better in, our, in reaching the community because we also want pastors who want to learn how to work in churches to plant and revitalize. We want them to be able to come here, intern here, do a residency here, and be equipped when they go and plant and revitalize. And so we need to be equipped to reach our community. You see, my job as a pastor from Ephesians, Ephesians says the role of the pastor is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. To equip the saints, to equip Jesus followers to do the ministry, make disciples, care for one another, meet the need, like meet needs. Like, like the job of the pastor is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Now, I've been at churches, and maybe you have been too, where the job of the pastor was to do the work for poorly equipped saints. Or maybe you've been at a church where the role of the pastor was to do all the work by high-paying saints. It's like, well, I give, I don't need to do the work. I give, I don't need to volunteer. I give, I don't need to serve. I give, I don't need to, I don't need to show up. I give, I don't, pastor, I give you money so that you can reach the community, so you better get to it. That's opposite. Now, do I, have a, do I have a role in this? Well, as a member of this church, as a, as a saint in this church, I do, have a, I do have a role to reach the community, but it is not my role solely. It is not the staff's role solely. It is not ministry directors and leaders to do that solely. It is our job. It is my job to equip you to do the work of the ministry. And so, we so said we wanna do that. We wanna be equipped we want, the church, we want the church to be equipped so that we can reach our community. But we also want it to, so that we, we can reach our community and teach other people how to reach our community so then when they leave, if they are part of one of those teams, they can reach their community. And so how do we do that? How do we do that? Well, it starts with a culture of invitation. And what we found is a high percentage, a high percentage of people at Grace, we did the church survey. If you haven't done it, you can still do it. I think this, it'll close up soon. A high percentage of people have invited, in the last year, have invited someone to church that doesn't go. 
That's important. It's not just, try, you know, we're not just trying to get people from other churches to come. to. We're trying to get people that aren't, aren't going to church anywhere. And we have a high number of that. We want to continue that culture of invitation. And so what that means for us is that we are ready for guests, that our church is welcoming Whenever people show up, they feel welcomed. Whenever people want to get involved, they, they, have a, they have a path or they have a personal relationship that can help them get involved, that it is not too hard to be a part of Grace Church. And that's why I say you can belong before you, before you believe. Like, we want you to come here. If you've been hurt, broken, wounded, if you're far from God, if you're running from God, if you've been hurt by church and church people, we want grace to be a safe place for you, a place that you can find your place, which that's the next one. We want people to be able to find their place. Now, we want them to be able to find their friends, to find their people. We want them to be able to find their group. And let me tell you, a group is pretty incredible. I was just reading, I, I went to group last night and, uh, I read this thing that a psychologist wrote that it's so incredible that the church, that psychology has figured out what the church has been doing for 2,000 years. It says that no meaningful change happens in a person's life outside of relationship. No meaningful change happens to a person outside of relationship. But not only that, psychologists will say that whenever you are in a, like a, when you're in a, when you're in a relationship with a, with a mental health professional, that, and that's what it is, but when you're in that relationship and you start, they say that it takes six months on average to start seeing change. Again, healthy things grow, but not like a tumor, like muscles at the gym. And so when you are in, you go, well, I served, but I didn't feel any different. I, I, I gave money, and I, I didn't feel any different. I went to my group and talked about the Bible, and I gave a prayer request. I don't feel any different. Let me tell you, do those things for six months. Get involved with people for six months. Six months, and just see. In relationship, serve, serve a community, you know, serve children, serve adults, lead a group, do something where you are serving others for six months and see if it doesn't change you. Find your place. Find your place and find your people. And then an important one is prayer in groups. And we know this one is powerful. Now, prayer is always powerful. Prayer is, is huge, it's, it's powerful, it's, you, it's your connection to our Heavenly Father. And when you pray, you don't, it's, I mean, it's beautiful. You don't, have to, you don't have to pray with an intermediary, you don't have to pray to, some, you know, to somebody and then they're gonna relay it to God. You can talk directly to the Father. And not only that, but you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. If you're a, if you're a a, a, a Jesus follower, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And it says the Holy Spirit prays, on you for, on, prays for you on your behalf whenever you don't even have the words, when you are racked with pain or emotion or dread or confusion or frustration or sadness. And you're like, God, I don't even, my, it feels like my heart's about to burst. The Holy Spirit prays for you. It's incredible. It's incredible. But we also know that prayer in group is powerful. In Acts, the Apostle Peter and the Apostle John were arrested in the, they were arrested in the, uh, the temple for preaching Jesus. And they said, hey, you better not, you better not do that again or you're gonna, we're, you know, we may do to you what we did to Jesus. And everybody, all, this, all their friends were worried about Peter and John. They were worried, worried to death. And they were, they were let go. And it says they came back to the house where they all were and they were so excited and they were so relieved and they, they prayed a prayer and they said, you know, God, you know, please help us to not, please help us to not, uh, not have to suffer the wrath of these folks. But more importantly than that, 
Help us to spread the message of the kingdom. That's the Aaron Giesler paraphrase. And it says, when they finished praying, the whole house was shaken. The whole place was shaken. Because we know that when you come together with other people and pray, it is powerful. And so what does it mean to be equipped to reach our community? It means that you develop that culture of invitation, that you are inviting people from your community. Hey, when you see them at school, when you, we preach sermons on this, on, you know, like the, the knots. I, hey, things are not going well. I'm not, not from around here. Uh, I was not expecting that. And then you're like, hey, come and sit with me at church. Come and sit with me while we do church. Prayer in groups. Take a walk around your neighborhood. Take a walk in your community with another person and pray for that community. And find your place. Because then not only are you just inviting them to church, you're inviting them to your place. Hey, come to my place and see my people. You see, God's called us to develop and launch teams, to plant revitalized churches here in Albuquerque, in New Mexico, the United States, and around the world. And we're not there yet but we're working towards that thing. And there have been so many times that I have been, I'm just, you know, I've said it. I've questioned God on it. God, are you sure? I don't know how. I don't see it. How can this be? But God still has us. Six years later, we are further along on that goal than I would have ever thought possible. He worked with a brand new, you know, when I was a brand new senior pastor, I'd never done it a day in my life. He gave me grace. He worked through a pandemic and he continues to work now. And so would you be a part? Jesus' follower, a Jesus follower is a multiplier and and a Jesus following church is a multiplier as well. So would you be a part of this? through giving, through praying, through inviting, finding your place, serving, would you be a part? Don't be on the sidelines. Don't be on the sideline. Jesus followers are multipliers. Don't be on the sidelines of your life, but don't be on the sidelines of your church. I love you guys. We'll see you next week when we talk about number eight on the fundamental list.